Bruiser Brody had some comments, uh, lucid or otherwise, about the match. Let's take a listen to him. Guess who? You got it right. Let me tell you something, Jerry Lawler. I found the end for you. I found the end for you. Just you and Bruiser Brody. There ain't nobody to hide behind this week. There ain't no Bill Dundies. There ain't no Andre the Giants. There ain't no big superstars from all over the world for you to get behind their skirts. It's just going to be you and 291 pounds of Bruiser Brody. Now I want to make one thing clear, because I know a lot of you people have been watching what's been going on here. That's right, two weeks in a row, I not only kicked Jerry Lawler in the behind, I kicked them referees around for getting their nose in my business. And I've just been told it's going to cost me a thousand dollars. I don't care. Here it is, I'm bringing it right out here. Right out here, here's a thousand dollars. My money, and it's a lot of money. But I know I'm going to get it back, you know what I mean? I know I'm getting this money back. You know where I'm getting it from? I'm getting it from the ex-king. The ex-king. You know what, Jerry Lawler should have been a used car salesman. Because them guys, they got everybody fooled. They make a dummy out of everybody. And that's what Lawler's been doing to you. He ain't no king of professional wrestling, no matter how many big guys, how many tough guys he beat up. I'm telling you, Jerry Lawler, you take a close look at my face. You take a close look at my head. Every time you hit me in the head, I hear people say, ooh, like you're doing something real, real mean. Well, I've been hit before. I've been knocked down before, and I always got up. And I'm telling you, man to man, you knock me down. You punch on my head, but I'm getting up. And when I get up, I'm kicking your face all over the Coliseum walls. That's a promise. The following show is a Pod Avenue production. You are cordially invited to have dinner with the king. Pull up a chair and join WWE Hall of Famer Jerry the King Lawler and Glenn Moore. Enjoy. It's episode number 90 of Dinner with the King. I am finally, finally, finally. episode number 10 away from the big one zero zero. Ooh, I think we get this far. All right. So episode I number never thought we'd hit 90. <laughs> well, here we are. Episode number 90, a new milestone for the podcast. I'm Glenn Moore, joined here by, you all know him, as WB Hall of Famer, the man who has a king, who has a key to the city of Tupelo now. <laughs> He's the king of Tupelo, some might there say. There you go. Uh, Is that what that means when you receive the key to the city from the mayor of a city? Well, I mean... I don't know what that means. I mean, what what happens when you get a key to a city? I mean, well, the you... first thing I first thing I did with mine was drop it. Believe it, it or not, no. I was it was so embarrassing. Yes, yes, it was embarrassing. Uh, we're in Tupelo, Mississippi. Last time, you know, this is the fortieth anniversary of one of the most famous matches that we ever had in our our company's history, the Tupelo Concession Stand Battle, where me and Bill Dundee battled the Blonde Bombers, who uh, were at the time. Uh, Larry Latham and Wayne Ferris, and of course Larry Latham went on to become Spot of the Moon Dogs, passed away now. But then uh, Wayne Ferris went on to become the Honky Tonk Man. So that was a big match. We fought back through the fans back into the concession stand, and then Lance Russell was up there commentating and taping it, and uh, the camera was uh, sort of up in the balcony shooting down on us as we tore apart the whole concession stand. It just went on and on and on. And So anyway, like I said, this was the 40th anniversary of that, and uh, yesterday was down in Tupelo all day, as a matter of fact, because they had Tupelo Comic Con going on this weekend. So I was at the Tupelo Comic Con uh most of the day and then that evening they had a big wrestling show and then that's where the mayor of the city of Tupelo came out 
uh, Mayor Sheldon, I believe his name is, and he came out and got in the ring. They had the TV cameras, the local media there and everything. And the, the mayor presented Bill Dundee and I with the keys to the city. So it's a beautiful little. The, the key's kind of big, and it was in a it was in a little wooden box with our name engraved on it and everything. And I opened the box up, and there's the gold key. And I thought, boy, this is right, real nice. And you know, it's in a little on a little um, velvet background and everything. And I I thought that the key was was like stuck into that uh, backing, right, where I could hold it up and show it to everybody. But it wasn't. It was just kind of laying there, and I didn't realize that. So I I held the I held the box up to show everybody in the audience the key, and of course the key fell right out onto the ground. Oh no! I felt like the guy. Did you see that? Did you see the guy throw out the first pitch at the Indians game? The, the guy from the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, I did not. Channing Frye. Oh my gosh! Yes. I mean, it, they almost hit the first baseman. Oh. It was an unbelievable. That had to be the worst opening pitch ever. I mean, and this guy's a professional athlete. He was on the Cavaliers when they won the NBA championship. And he throws a pitch that went way down the first baseline and it wasn't close to anybody. And that's what I felt like when I dropped the key to the city after the mayor gave it to me. <laughs> oh, my God. So, But I, I recovered quickly. I picked it up and made a little, you know, made it all nice with the speech. So what is that? So when you get a key to the city, I mean, obviously, I never got a key to the city. But as what does that entail? Like, what do you do? You get like 10 percent off know. any all the restaurants? <laughs> or? Yeah, 10 percent off a Dollar Tree. <laughs> <laughs> Too below. No, I don't think you get anything really. I, I made the joke there, you know. I, my old line, I always say, I got this. I got a key to the city of Memphis one time, and I had a couple more keys over my career. But I always say, you know, hey, they gave me the key to the city, and then the next day they changed the locks. Yep. And I think that's that's probably what happens when they get the key to the city, you know. All right. So before we talk about our subject, which I want to talk about to you, King, is uh, Bruiser Brody. You. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> faced him a few times throughout your career. Yes, I did. Especially when he came through Memphis in 85. And I have some, uh, at the beginning of the show, you guys heard uh, a, a Bruiser Brody promo shot in Memphis uh, for his partner with the King. And I have some audio of uh, your match against Bruiser Brody in Memphis, Miss Al Coliseum, and uh, some other more, more promos from yourself uh, on Bruiser Brody and then Bruiser Brody wearing the King's crown, cutting a promo. Yeah, on the I remember King. that. <laughs> and saliva is just pouring out of his mouth and spit all over the microphone. Just a typical Bruiser Brody, um, a typical Bruiser Brody promo. So before we get into that, but you were you were gone for uh, I think you were home for like what a day last week because you were in Vegas all oh, week. Man, yeah, uh, Tupelo. Um, yeah, I did. Um... Where did I come from? Where was I last weekend? Well, I did the, of course, the uh, uh, the Danbury, Connecticut shows. Did we talk about that? Yes, we did. We did? No, we we, we did no, a show you, before you we left were, for we Danbury. We talked about we were going to go do Danbury and, and Holyoke, Massachusetts. Oh, that's right. Yes. Oh, yeah, because yeah. we have to talk about the I King. The there you go. Yes. We haven't even talked about that. No. I won my 171st championship. I thought it was 173. Me? I know. I don't know. No, no, no. It started out with 168, and then I I had the, won the, uh, the grizzly weight thing, and then me and Rikishi won the, the won the uh, Memphis Grizzlies tag team championship from the Steiner brothers. That made it 170, and then me and Keith Youngblood won the NEW Northeast Wrestling Tag Team Championships in Danbury, Connecticut last Friday night. So that was pretty cool. We had in our corner none other than uh, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Yeah. And we beat these guys that call themselves, they were the King King's Court, uh, that King Brian up there. And then King Brian, it was the wildest night ever. It was crazy. Um, a huge crowd. I mean, there was packed there in Danbury. It was a big, big, big turnout. And the main event, you know, we were the semi-main. And then the main event was, um, it, well, it was that King, the King Brian guy, against uh, David Arquette. Right. And they've had a long-running feud. I don't know, you know, that David Arquette trying to get involved in wrestling, and he's done a few shows up in Northeast Wrestling. And then it came down to this, came down to the confrontation between David Arquette and uh, this. Uh, King Brian and they were on right after us and so I stayed dressed and I'm watching the I'm watching the match and everything and you think you know I mean it's it's 
it's the last match, and David Arquette, everybody's loving loving David Arquette. And he's, I mean, the guy, he really tries. He really does. And he's he's learned quite a bit. He's not, he's not as you would say, uh, embarrassing at all. The guy, you know, he's he had a great match. I mean, he's not, he's, he's so much more, uh, I mean, whenever I think of guys like David Arquette, I think of Andy Kaufman. And, of course, Andy Kaufman knew really nothing about wrestling. He, you know, he shouldn't have even have been in there. But David Arquette, I got to give him credit. He's really tried to learn the business and tried to, you know, uh, he's he's re- he's serious about being involved in wrestling, and so far he's done well. And so I w- really expected for some kind of way that uh, David Arquette would, uh, with help from somebody, he would, you know, get his hand raised at the end of the night here in this match. But it did not work out that way. Somehow, I think David Arquette went to the. Uh, it was a false, I think the false, there's no disqualification or something false counted anywhere. I don't know. But anyway, the, David Arquette goes and he sets this table up in the middle of the ring. He gets a table in the ring and he's got the best of this King Brian. And so he takes this King Brian, they, they climb up to the top rope and David Arquette is about to, to, I think he's going to try to suplex, uh, King Brian into this table through this table. Right. And so at the last second, somehow, this is King Brian guy reverses it, and he slams David Arquette through the table. Yeah. Right. And then he pins him. And so it's like, you know, shocking. One, two, three, and David Arquette gets pinned in this match that he'd been, you know, building up for so long. And uh, and so I, I was just, I literally, literally was shocked there watching it myself. And so... Uh, you know, the King Brian, he's and they play his music and he's all happy and he's leaving and he goes out and, and David Arquette, he's all crumpled up. He's just gone through this table and and all of a sudden he he's gets up and he pulls himself up and he gets the microphone and he he starts he starts blaming his loss on the fans. Oh, no. Yeah, he starts he starts ranting and raving and screaming at the fans and uh, uh, saying, you know, you people really didn't support me. I, you know, this, this is your fault. I, you, you really didn't get behind me. I, that's why I didn't win this match here tonight. I blame this loss on all of you people. You know, I'm sick of all of everybody, right? And so, I mean, everybody's like, then you know how people are, the fans. I mean, they were like turning on him immediately. Yeah. So, so I felt bad. So I, I go out because he had, you know, he had done, I, he had done some stuff with. With uh, you know, heck, talk with me about the matches and and that sort of thing up there beforehand. So I felt bad. So I walk. I figure I'll go out to the ring, and kind of cool him off or whatever. And I'll I'll get him back to the back. I thought maybe he just hit his head or something, and he's just going goofy on us, right? So I go in. I go out to the ring, and uh, I said, David, come on, probably hit your head or something. Let's easy ease up on the people now. Mm. Let's let's go back to the back. And he says. Yeah, it was all of a sudden. It was reminiscent of Andy Kaufman. He says, "Don't touch me, Lawler." I'm. He actually said the word. I'm from Hollywood. Oh no. I'm not a wrestler. I'm an actor. You know, I should. I. You don't even. You're not even supposed to be. I wouldn't book to wrestle you here tonight. Get your hands off me. And so I said, "Come on, David. Let's go to the back. Don't touch me. I'll sue you, Lawler. I'll. Su- I mean, it was. It was like I, all of a sudden I was back in 1983." Here's a here's another actor, comedian, or whatever he is, threatening to sue me, telling me to keep my hands off of him. And this went on and on there for another couple of minutes. And all of a sudden, he sticks his finger in my chest and he said, "You get away from me! I'll sue you, Lawler. Don't touch me! I wouldn't book the rest of you." So, I said, "What the hell?" Yep. I kicked him in the stomach, picked him up, and piled around him. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yep. I piled drive David Arquette right there, just like I did Andy Kaufman. Oh, man. So now we're going to have what? Uh, David, I don't know. David I don't Arquette know if we're going to have anything. I don't, no, I, don't, I don't know if anybody's heard from him since. Oh, geez. Well, I saw some tweets because uh, I saw a picture of you pile driving him, and then um, I saw some tweets. You know, he was, he's going to get uh, some lawyers on you to, to sue you, <laughs> a la Andy Kaufman. And right. and so I was like, whoa, what happened? Did, uh, what, what's going what on in up in New England area that, that weekend, but uh, well, David Arquette maybe has to learn the hard way like Andy Kaufman. I guess so. so. But anyway, I was just happy it was a good weekend for me because uh, won another championship with another 
Keith Youngblood and I are the Northeast Wrestling Tag Team Champions of the world. Uh, the Northeast world. <laughs> <laughs> so now you have to, you know, carry that belt around everywhere now, right? Well, you know what? I'm not. I'm, I'm not booked up there again until uh, next month. I'm looking at my book. Not booked up there. So I asked Michael Lombardi. I said, "Could and Keith?" I said, uh, "Of course, we we had wrestled, and uh, the following night we were in a six man tag in uh, Holyoke, Massachusetts, and we wore the titles out there. But then I said, guys, instead of me having to lug this thing around to the airports and everything, could, could you guys just keep them up here until the next time? So we, we took some pictures with the titles and the belts and everything, and then uh, but then I let Michael Lombardi hang on to my belt until I come back to defend it. There you go. Yeah. Tag team champion. Is that something? 171. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, so, well. Panini was happy. Hi, Panini. 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 Yeah. Well, PJ. PJ. That's what PJ. I call it. Yeah. PJ. So that uh, that weekend went well. Then you, um, what well, you were home for a day? We were probably were home for a day because you left. <laughs> for a day is right. That Monday for Las Vegas. I did. We had to go out to Las Vegas. This is the annual observance of the Cauliflower Alley Club. Ooh. Have you ever been to that? I've heard of it. I've seen some, you know, documentary videos about it, but I have not been been to a event like that. No. Well, of course, I understand this was. Oh, let me see. What was it that they kept saying? It may have been like the 54th anniversary, over over 50 years. This thing was started. The Cauliflower Alley Club was started by, um, uh, what was his name? Mike Mazurki. Okay. Does that name ring a bell? No. He was a wrestler, and then he was he became an actor, a famous actor in a lot of movies. But he had these huge cauliflower ears. Just big, look like two doorknobs uh, hanging on each side of his head, and and then somebody took a picture of, and he started this club uh, when he retired from wrestling, and it was just kind of a way for all the years. It was sort of like a, a wrestlers convention. They had it in Las Vegas every year, and up until a few years ago, it was just for wrestlers only. I mean, if you'd ever been involved in wrestling in any way, if you'd only had one match or a thousand matches, you were invited. You could come and become a member of the Cauliflower Alley Club. Um, and uh, you could go to the, you could go to the, uh, the convention every year. And, and in the past few years, they've opened it up now to fans and fans can go and they have, a, they, it's, uh, it was in the Gold Coast uh, hotel and casino and they have big rooms set up where you know you can go in and all these the, these wrestlers from the past are in there different different wrestlers are set up you know doing signing autographs and taking pictures and they have these great displays of uh you know past wrestlers from over the years i mean going back to i mean as far back as you can imagine uh on on as wrestling as wrestling uh when it started they got stuff on all these guys it's really interesting and and then of course you see a, a bunch of guys that um uh, you know you hadn't hadn't seen in a long time but just tons of tons of people go to this thing and this year um the wwe called me up and said hey would you go we're gonna have two tables at the banquets and um you know, we'd like you to be there as kind of a kind of a WWE representative. Sue Aitchison was there. She went. Ben Brown from the WWE was on hand from Talent Relations there. And then, of course, uh, one of the people that they were honoring, inducting into the Cauliflower Alley Club, he got the Iron Mike Mazurki Award, and that was Mark Henry. Oh. Yeah. So Mark, Mark Henry gets up. He gets introduced by D'Lo Brown. And D'Lo and, of course, Mark Big Buddies, and they told a few stories. And then Mark... Uh, Mark got up there, and it was, it was funny because mentioned winning the title. He said, "He said I can't believe the the King Jerry Lawler sitting over here. Here I am up here talking about retiring from wrestling. I had my first match with King Lawler uh, back when I, you know, the first match I had with Jerry Lawler when I started in WWE. And now he said I'm I'm finished, and he's still out there winning titles this past weekend. <laughs> he said, there's there's got to be we need to take his DNA or something. He's like a, the Terminator or whatever. So." But it was it was kind of cool. There were a lot of uh, uh, a lot of different guys receiving different awards. The second night went kind of long. Some people talked for a long time. Mm. One of them mainly was uh, David Schultz. 
Oh, yeah. You remember Dr. D. David Schultz? I do remember him, yes. <laughs> He's the guy that slapped John Stossel, and he made it abundantly clear. He even told me beforehand. He said, Darren Long, you, you, uh, you went on Stone Cold Steve Austin's podcast, and you told everybody that I cuffed John Stossel in the ear and broke his eardrum. And I said, well, I thought you did. He said, no, I did not. I never hit him in his eardrum. That's what that was his story. I just slapped his face or just slapped him right in the right in the jaws and everything. Um, and he said, Stone Cold lied about that, too. And he was he was kind of upset. He was he was a little uh, volatile, as a matter of fact. Uh, Dave was uh, I, I didn't realize it. I mean, you know, with the WWE had two big tables right there. The, this huge room, um, probably 1500 people in there. At the time, the WWE had two tables right up front, and me, Jerry Briscoe, Sergeant Slaughter, Sue Aitchison, um, uh Let's see who all this was there. Um, gosh, more people anyway. I can't think of. Well, I'll tell you. I'll probably come to me in a second though. Um, but anyway, we're all sitting there, and man, he gets up, and David Schultz starts lambasting Vince McMahon, oh, saying that, "Oh my gosh," he said that Vince. Uh, fired him, and after he hit, uh, you know, after he hit uh, John Stossel, which he said is what Vince McMahon wanted him to do, and told him afterwards, "Oh, that was great and everything." And then all of a sudden, he fires him. When I guess John Stossel wins a four hundred, win the four hundred fifty thousand dollar settlement yeah. for the uh, lawsuit, and then David Schultz said he lost his house and you know, put him out on the street and all this kind of stuff. And he said, nobody, not one of you people out there, nobody called me to help me then. Not even you, Jerry Lawler. I'm like, what the heck? What if I'm getting missioned every time, right? Jeez. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, David told us a few stories about, uh, about back in the day when he started, you know, he kind of pretty much started here in Memphis. Uh, uh, Herb Welch, old wrestler here from up in Dyersburg, trained uh, trained him and then we kind of helped train him and he got started and he and I would make some trips together and he told a couple stories about how uh, and one of them I didn't remember one of them I did remember it was a couple of those road stories where uh, he said we're just leaving the matches I, I think it may have been in Tupelo or something and he said we're leaving the matches and I'm driving he's he's over in the passenger seat and he said a guy comes up and sticks a gun right to the side of my head uh, in the window a fan and um and he said, I just turned and looked at him. I said, Dave, this guy's got a gun. <laughs> he <laughs> said, he said, I bailed out the he said, I bailed out the passenger door and he said, I happen to have a baseball bat. And he said, I came around the back of the car with that baseball bat, and the guy with the gun went running and he said, Well, I finally wound up throwing the baseball bat at the guy. And uh, so that was uh, that was one story. Then another story, he said another guy then another guy came to the car and he had a baseball bat. And he said, David said, <clears throat> I had this long rubber rubber hose like thing with a piece of metal uh attached to the end of it and, he, and i do remember this part he said i just bailed out of he said i bailed out of the passenger seat again and he said i come around and he said i whacked this guy and he started screaming oh and he said i whacked him again he's oh and he said he said i'm just running down the street and he said i'm just nailing this guy with his hose and the guy's screaming every time and, I, and that that really did happen uh so anyway he told a couple stories about us and then Went on to lambast Nick, and uh, not, not, he did not lambast Nick Goulas at the time, too, but he, he really came down on Vince McMahon pretty hard, and he talked a long time. Then he went into the stories about how he was a uh, – uh, he, after, after he got out of the, the wrestling, after he got let go by the WWE, he started – he became a bounty hunter. And oh, apparently yeah. he was – yeah, he was like a badass bounty hunter. <laughs> he told a few stories of uh, things that he did as a bounty hunter. But anyway, yeah, David Schultz got uh, inducted. He he won the Men's Wrestling Award, uh, and then Luthez Luthez got the Lifetime Achievement. No, Luthez it was the Luthez Lifetime Achievement Award, but it went to Dory Funk Jr. Oh yeah, yeah, and Dory was there, and um, something I knew Dory didn't look exactly right. Something was wrong, and he had a little problem when he got up there talking. And then afterwards, his wife, Marty, came over to us and said, said, oh, Dory didn't get the mentions. He said he wanted to mention you, Jerry. And he said, uh, but he he had an allergic reaction to um, 
like some kind of wheat. I think she said like buckwheat or something that he had eaten or whatever. And his whole mouth was like, it was, it was like swollen and, and red and everything. And, and she said, can you imagine this happening on the day that, you know, ha- he ate something out here in Vegas and he had this reaction right on the night of this, of this award for him. But anyway, Dory Funk won the, uh, got the Luthes Lifetime Achievement Award. Mark Henry, of course, he, uh, uh, he got up and talked about his career. It was great. Uh, Nick Kozak, you remember that name? Sounds familiar, yeah. Nick Kozak, he got, he won a, he got, uh, uh, it was called the Men's Wrestling Award. But uh, anyway, a lot of people did not remember who Nick Kozak was, but apparently he was a big name. Scott Teal, who's one of the guys that, uh, Scott Teal and B, and B. Brian Blair, they're the guys that are the main two uh, guys. I think B, B. Brian Blair is the president. Scott Teal may be the vice president or something, but they're the guys that really do all the work to put this, uh, put this thing on. Scott Teal introduced Nick Kozak, and Nick Kozak, oh, man, he talked for a really long time. Hmm. <laughs> really long time. Um, but then my favorite, the guys, uh, Bambi won an award. If you remember Bambi, um, and Andrew Anderson won the men's wrestling award. Anyway, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of awards given out. JP diamond here, host of the hottest little rock and roll show in the world. Hot trucks. We bring you the classics and the best new rock and lots of fun with people not listening to the hot trucks and much more. We have double shots and triple threats of your favorite artist. You'll find Hot Trucks on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Spotify. Everything Hot Trucks is at jprockin.com. It's the hottest little rock and roll show in the world. Hot Trucks, jprockin.com. Say, you're Bobby Rivers, right? Bobby barely registers and nods while he looks around for women. I love how you beat Willie Dean tonight. I hate that guy. Bobby looks at the bar and sees Willie Dean talking to two girls. Hey, Chris, kayfabe. He looks at the fan. Sorry, man, we stay here. There's going to be a fight. You know what I mean? Let's go, Chris. Chris asks, why didn't we stay? There wasn't going to be any fight. Listen, brother. Bert Ironside's rule number one. Baby faces and heels do not socialize. Why? It's all about protecting the business. You don't tell your five-year-old that there's no Santa Claus and faces and heels do not sit in a bar full of marks drinking together. Kings of the Ring is the first audio drama podcast based on wrestling. Search Kings of the Ring from any podcast app or kingsotr.com. But the tag team award went to Haku and the Barbarian. Yeah. You remember those guys? Yeah, the faces of fear. Faces of fear, exactly right. Well, I, you know what? A lot of stuff happens that that I, uh, I mean, a lot of stuff happened in my career. I don't know if I wasn't really paying attention a lot or something. I, I just I don't remember a lot of this stuff. But I'm sitting there, and and here comes Haku and the Barbarian up, and uh, you know, me and Lauren are sitting there, and all of a sudden, uh, Barbarian looks over. He says, "I want to thank." King Jerry Lawler. King Lawler meant so much to my career. And I'm looking around and saying, he talking about me? <laughs> then all of us, then I realized, then he told a story. I, I remembered he, he told a story about how he just first got started and he was making, I mean, literally wrestling for food. I mean, when he first got started, some guys, they would, they, they would just like sort of get, uh, it was like no money. When he first started, I think he got his first match out in California or something. Anyway, finally, he he made his way to Memphis. He said, I had this huge afro. He says it was, he said it was gigantic. And he said, King Lawler. He said, Jenny Lawler. He said, he always called me kid. He said, he said come, in, come in my office, kid. He said, he sat me down and he said, I'm going to shave your head, kid. I'm going to give you a different gimmick. And he said, he shaved my head into a mohawk, and and he called me King Conga. 30-minute time limit for television. One fall, 30-minute time limit. Introducing the challenger for the belt at 261 pounds. Out of the streets of New York City, King Conga. 
and the champion, 234 pounds from Memphis, Tennessee, the King, Jerry Lawler. One fall, 30-minute time limit for the Southern Heavyweight Championship. The referee is Jerry Calhoun. And he said, that's where my career started. He said, I work on the main event with Jerry Lawler in Memphis, and he was so strong. He, he, he said, he, he put me over so strong. He said, he never take one. He said, I never take one bump during the match. He take all the bumps. He put me over like Superman till the finish of the match. And he said, afterwards, he said, I got my check. For working the main event, he said, I never in my life got a check this big. I took my check. I showed it to my wife. I said, I think maybe they made a mistake. Maybe this, this may be for maybe Austin Idol's check or something. This must be somebody. And he said, my wife said, you better call Mr. Lawler and make sure this is not a mistake. He said, I never oh. seen this much money. He said, so I called Jerry Lawler. And he said, he said, Mr. Lawler, this check, I never seen so much money is maybe a mistake. And he said, King said, kid, is your name on the check? He said, yes. King Lawler said, take it to the bank. So, I mean, you know, that was just, that was a story. Then another, another story he said that, that, that I do remember as well. He said, he said, he said, before the match, King Lawler called me into the, to his room in his dressing room. He says, Kid, I want you. I want you to get some juice. <laughs> and I said, some juice, okay. You what kind of orange juice? What kind? Of? <laughs> <laughs> right? And he said, no, no. I want you. I want to you get some color. So he said, I still wasn't sure what he meant. He said, anyway, we go out. We had the match, and he'd make me. He put me over so strong. He said, I never took a bump to the entire match until finally it was a lumberjack match. And he said, finally, King hit me. I rolled. I took a bump. I rolled out of the ring. And he said, all of a sudden, Austin Idol, he said, he cut my head from east to the west. <laughs> he said, all the way across. He said, I'm bleeding like crazy. And see that after the match, I go and King Lawler says, kid, come in my room. He said, I go in, I sit down, and blood everywhere, blood all over me. And he said, King said, kid, you've got to take care of yourself. Don't ever, ever let somebody else cut you. And he said, I never forgot that King Lawler meant so much to me. He said, and, and I was just sitting there, I mean, you know, I'm just thinking, my gosh, this guy's got this whole wrestling career yeah. that he's just had, you know, and he's all telling stories about me and Memphis and the wrestling at the Mid-South Coliseum, so... It was great, and 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 he and Haku both talked about you know what, what the business meant to their families. You know, their uh, uh, those guys. Uh, they said they were both in the business for their families. You know, that's what that's what that's why they uh, lasted so long. They put food on the table and that sort of thing. And he really, he really thought Memphis, uh, you know, meant a lot to his career. Wow. So when you're sitting there, I mean, someone's talking about you. I mean, what's going? Through your mind, I mean, it has to be humbling, right? It was. It really was. It, it, yeah, it sure was. I mean, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure if you've, you know, I, I know you don't remember much, but I'm sure if you you've had, you know. Very... Oh well, and and you know what was funny too? Then right at, then right after that, they showed a video of some and, and the whole purpose of this cauliflower alley club. They raise a lot of money, and guys, the guys can join, and it cost you know it doesn't cost a lot to join. But the the money that they raise during the during this event and and throughout the years, they use to you know they use to help wrestlers uh, that a lot of people don't hear about that are kind of in need. And and one person that they're working with right now, they've just set up a GoFundMe. Jr. said, "I'm going to donate a thousand dollars right here tonight to uh, for Kamala." And of course, you know Kamala because of diabetes and uh, and that sort of thing. He's lost both his legs. They had a video of Kamala uh, from his home and uh, a long video talking about, uh, you know, sort of talking about his career and thanking uh, everybody at the Cauliflower Alley Club for helping him out. And and then that's what Brian Blair said afterwards. If it wasn't for the Cauliflower Alley Club, Kamala probably would have lost his house. But now, you know, they've paid and and uh, you know he's he's getting in pretty good shape. 
Well, I was going to say is there's there's so many people that uh, you know you've you've had a hand in their career, whether just starting out or progressing into you know their lucrative careers. I mean, if we could put together a tree of guys <laughs> who've had an effect on, I mean, that tree would be massive. Yeah, and I swear I just didn't, you know, I, I don't know if I took it for granted or I, I think that's probably the best way to explain it. I just kind of took it for granted that that was just part of the job right. that I was doing every day, you know. Um, and I, I never I never did it because of the, the to try to get credit for it or to try to uh, have anybody be indebted to me or anything. I just I just, you know, that to me, especially being. Uh, you know, back when Jerry Jarrett and I were partners in Memphis and, and we were trying to come up with new angles and new ideas every week, creating new talent was, was part of the, uh, that was definitely probably the most important part of the job. And, and to me, that was always fun. I mean, like I really, I really loved, you know, putting together the videos and, 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 and coming up with the idea and stuff for the, for different characters like Kamala. Um, I mean, you know, Jerry Jarrett and, and um, uh, our company there basically created the first look at what Hulk Hogan would be. You know, when he first when he came into our territory, he was just a just a tall green guy, uh, nothing special, named Terry Bole, and suddenly we put together these videos on him and and called him the Hulk. And and when you see these videos. You know, look back at him today. You go, my gosh, that's, you know, that's how he got. That's, that's how it was born. The Hulk gimmick, you know, and guys, you know, the fabulous ones, Rock and Roll Express. I mean, so many guys that we that we really helped launch their career here in Memphis, and that was, uh, that was just part of it. And I guess I did take a lot of that for granted. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you don't think about it at the time, but the person that you're helping or the person that you give advice to just a few words goes a long way. And I can only imagine, you know, them taking that to heart and they remember that, you know, 30, 30 years later, yeah. you, know, you have, you know, barbarian talking about you like that. It's, it's fresh in their mind always. Yeah. So anyway, that was that kind of cool. And Jr. Jr. JJ Dillon MC the first night. And then the second night, uh, Jr. MC'd and, uh, it was cool. JR. Good old I saw a picture of you and Lauren and JR sitting together at the dinner table. Yeah. Yeah, somebody said that like uh, all the <laughs> said uh there were there were these tickets they they gave they had a big raffle and that's where part of the money went to I think to Kamala. And uh what was the prize? Oh, somebody had created this every every year they create this big beautiful championship belt and uh it's just a it's a cauliflower alley club championship belt. And that's what the raffle tickets were for. You pay a dollar or whatever for these, these tickets and you get a chance to win that uh, championship belt. Can't remember who exactly won it. Somebody that we know though, but anyway, it was, it was cool. Uh, and then we got, then we went back to, we went back to the hotel. Lauren and I went back to the hotel with, um, with Sue Aitchison and, uh, all of a sudden, as we were going into the Palms Hotel, real nice hotel, they're shooting a music video. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, they're shooting a music video on this big long limousine, like a like a uh, oh, what's those big uh, like the what are those like the Hummer? Yeah, big yeah. Hummer limousine. Hey, yeah. good job, job. Big Hummer limousine is pulled up. And all of a sudden, they hear this music. It was And, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you who it was. But anyway, he gets out. And he's got all this gold wrapped chains around him. He's got diamonds in his teeth. And he goes in. As soon as he goes in the door, a bunch of these, about six of these showgirls, Las Vegas showgirls with all the feathers and stuff, they follow in behind him. And they start walking behind him. And they're just shoot shooting this one scene right there at the, at the front entrance, right? His name was, um, oh, my gosh. Who was it? Who was it? B oh man, I may have to I may have to call Lauren to remember what the guy's name was. Oh no, I remember, I remember. Yella Beezy. Never heard you know, of him. What? You never heard of Yella Beezy? <laughs> never heard heard of him in my life. I put his name in. in he's Google. got a, he's got over a million uh, Instagram followers. Yeah. Yella Beezy. Well, he was shot three times. And live what? and live to, to hear about it. Oh, you're kidding! To talk about it, yeah, he was uh, October 2018. 
He was shot early in the morning, drive-by shooting. 20 shots were fired and hitting easy a total of eight times. What? And he lived. <laughs> yeah, he looked in great shape. He came over after you when know, we got inside, and he's like a he's a big wrestling fan. He said, "Man, I watch you all my life." Yellow Beasy. Oh, there's two. Okay, there's two. I've learned over the years. You know, I I, I like old school rap music, like '90s and 2000s. And there's two wrestlers <laughs> that rappers love. It's Ric Flair and Jerry Lawler. Oh, really? <laughs> Well, you know, Three Six Mafia, which is a rap group in Memphis. Yeah, you know, they, they, they mentioned me in their songs. Yeah, they mentioned you in your songs. I know Yo Gotti. Have you ever heard of Yo Gotti? Yeah, I've heard, definitely heard of Yo Gotti. Yeah, Yo Gotti's mentioned me in his songs. And you know, they they the King Jerry Lawler has has been name dropped in many rap <laughs> records throughout the years. So they 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 love you, King. Rappers love you. Well, that's cool. There's even uh, underground rappers have a whole whole <laughs> song about you. What fire in their face <laughs> is, the, <laughs> is the rap song? I, I got to do the link, but it's just basically fire in the face. Yeah, it's a it's a rap song. It's like uh, you know talking about you know throwing fire in the face of his enemy. That's like the way you you do. Hmm. So well, so anyway, yeah, we got to watch the. He did about they did about we talked to, afterwards. Lauren talked to the showgirls, and they said, "Oh my gosh, we did been doing this for ten hours today. Oh my gosh. This one shot." They must have. They must have redone it. She said about twenty five times. Well, y- y- yellow beezy must be a uh, keen for perfection. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yellow beezy. Yellow beezy. Can't wait to go. Well, and uh, I don't think we made it into the. Lauren was trying to ease her way into the shot, but she didn't make it. Oh. All right. So. But anyway, Vegas, that was yeah, it's fun out there. Yeah. So Vegas was fun. Uh, we and we'll be going back to Vegas soon. Yeah, Starcast. Starcast. Uh, unfortunately. Terry Funk will not, so we're not doing the uh, empty arena match. Uh, perspective. <laughs> but you and JR will be doing a show together. Yeah. And then that may, uh, be, that may be our last show. And then you'll be doing uh, meet and greets. Because uh, JR has joined. JR has joined. I don't know if you know this or not, but JR has uh, signed a contract with All In Wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is it an All Elite Wrestling? Is it this is. A, this is a new promotion. Good old, good old Jr. He was feeling no pain during the uh, <laughs> during the end when he was emceeing the show. Uh, I got to blame it. I'm going to blame it on Jerry Briscoe. Jerry Briscoe kept giving Jr. Moscow mules. Oh man! During while he was emceeing the show, I bet I think I saw him give him five. And during the emceeing of the show. So somewhere along the line between the awards, Jr. said, I don't care. I'm 67 years old, and I just signed a big contract with All In Wrestling. Oh, my God. <laughs> but I'm... of course he meant All Elite Wrestling. Right, but yeah, if they're giving you the highest and, contract. Well, you know, and hey, going... so uh, at that time of the night, most of the people in there, they weren't. They weren't even hearing what Jr. was saying because they were all like, "It was." It's cocktail started at uh, at uh, five o'clock, and then dinner was at six, and then the awards started at seven. And Jr. made this comment at about eleven. Okay, so, so it's kind of hidden until you yeah. bring it out to all of our listeners here. Yeah, I bet nobody else probably remembered it at all. Jeez, well, good. For I, was the only, I was the. I was. I was probably the only one not drinking in yeah. the whole place. I bet. Yeah. Well, those Moscow mules go down quick, so. <laughs> Jeez. Well, good old JR. Is he doing well? Yeah. I mean, is he excited for oh, all yeah. of yeah. yeah, Yeah, absolutely. He is. Yeah. There you go. Well, all the all these pictures of you and JR, you're doing the show at StarCast in Vegas, Memorial Day weekend. Everybody's saying, oh, bring the king to AEW. Well, the, people forget that you just signed a two-year contract. Yeah, I'm time signed, sealed, and delivered with WWE. Yeah. Um, I just yeah. So a lot of people are saying that. Oh, bring King. That'd be nice to have you and Jr. reunited. Well, and, and I talked with Jr. and I guess that uh, uh, he went down somewhere last week and did some practice runs with his new AEW announced team. Yeah, he's gonna have. They're gonna have a three man booth apparently. And uh, one of the guys is Alex Marvez. Do you know Alex? Yeah, big uh, fo- you know, and I know him. Yeah. Being in the yeah, media he's, football, he's, yeah, I guess he's Jacksonville Jaguars guy, you yeah. know. So he's going to be one of the guys in the booth. And the other guy is somebody that I do not know at all. He's called Excalibur. Yes. 
You know who that is? I know him because he did like the first uh, show, the uh, All In Show in Chicago. He was part of the, the he did the, part of the broadcast team. So I I don't know him past that. Now, but uh, now apparently he wears a mask. Yeah, he wears a mask. <laughs> He's gonna be a color commentator with a mask. I mean, that's I guess that's his gimmick. Oh. I mean, well, is that, as a color commentator, he's got a gimmick. Well, if like Ray Mysterio did a color commentary, wouldn't he still wear the mask? Well, yeah, Ray was a, is a wrestler, a masked wrestler. Oh, well, well, maybe this guy was too. Is this guy was he a wrestler? I I don't I do not know any more past uh, him being at uh, <laughs> All In in Chicago. I, I I would think he is. Yeah, he's a he's a retired <clears throat> professional wrestler. Oh, okay. Well, then there's his gimmick. So he's re- he's a mask yeah, guy. He's a uh, retired. In 2007, and then he became the company's play-by-play commentator, uh, PWG, out, out in L.A. Oh, okay. So, well, there you go. So, yeah. There you go. That's going to be their... Yeah, so it's like, I mean, it's like, okay, you're, you, that's your gimmick. You wear a mask while you wrestle. You can't just take it off because you're doing color, right? Well... That's like you. You know, you're the King Jerry Lawler. Do you not bring your crown to co- commentary? Even though you're not wrestling that night, you're still the king? Yeah. So you're bringing it your gimmick to the, yeah, you know, to the table. I got you. <laughs> you don't like the mask. You want to see your face. You want to see the face. <laughs> no, I don't care about the mask. No? Okay. But Jr. Are they are they meshing well? Are they is it going to be decent? You yeah, think? I asked. I asked Jr. He says, "Yeah, it's good." He said, it "Wasn't me and you, but it was good." It was good. <laughs> come on, King. Come back. No, oh, no. Come on. King. <laughs> no, no. Come on, King. Anyway, all right. So that was else? so that so that was great. So uh, well, we we had hit an hour so far for the podcast, and I didn't even get the main topic yet. Well, Bruiser Brody, Bruiser Brody, Bruiser Brody, a uh, documentary by uh, Vice uh, TV, The Dark Side of the Ring, and they have a a series. They kind of talk about the uh, you know the the stories that not a lot of people talk about when it comes to professional wrestling, and one of them is the death of Bruiser Brody in uh, Puerto Rico. So they, they highlighted his whole career. They, t- they talked about, you know, him going to Puerto Rico, what happened down there, Tony Atlas, you know, Dutch Mantel was down there. And um, uh, since, you know, this happened, the, the show came out last week, I figured we could talk about Bruiser Brody because he came through Memphis and he was just kind of, when you see a you know, guy like Bruiser Brody, 6'8", 300 pounds, whipping, a, whipping a, a, a chain, an actual chain over his head in the crowd, people are scattering. Uh, this guy has to stick out in your mind with all the guys you wrestled over the years. Oh yeah, without a doubt. I mean, and and Bruiser Brody was the guy whose his reputation preceded him. He was just like if you had never met him or certainly never wrestled him, you had heard these stories that were almost like horror stories. I mean, this guy was supposedly so freaking stiff and would just beat people up. And 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 in all honesty, that was you know. A lot of that was the uh, reputation was was uh, well deserved because especially young guys, you know, back in the day, you'd have a lot of what you call job matches where you just have enta- enhancement talent go in and and make the stars like Bruiser Brody look good. <clears throat> well, I think Brody had a reputation of taking advantage of young guys like that and just beating the crap out of them. And apparently that's what happened over in Japan uh, not Japan, over in Puerto Rico, uh, where he he beat up a couple of young guys, the enhancement talent guys that were kind of just getting started. And then the guy, um, one of the uh, owners, uh, Carlos Colon, of course, was the owners. And then the other guy, what was the, guy, what was the guy's name that stabbed him? Uh, it was uh, Jose Gonzalez. There you go, Jose Gonzalez. Yeah. So apparently uh, they went in the shower, Jose Gonzalez, and, and – he was going to. He just wanted to confront um, Bruiser Brody about him taking advantage of these young guys, and you know, of course, I wasn't there. And I, I honestly, I've heard that nobody actually saw the confrontation or, or whatever happened between these two guys. But it was just in the shower. Some other guys were outside the shower, and whether it was whether who attacked who, but uh, uh, apparently the guy then had a, a knife. And he just like sliced Bruiser Brody right across his stomach, and and from what I heard, when he came staggering out of the out of the, uh, the shower, that he was literally holding his intestines in his hand, 
that he cut the guys off all the way east to west, as you know, like uh, like King Kong said. But uh, and he just, you know, just was like in shock that this had happened. And um, uh, you know, I guess Brody went down. Brody went down, and an ambulance was called. And from what I heard, it was like. 45 30 45 minutes before the ambulance even got there yeah and uh but pr- pretty much brody bled to death yeah it was uh well i guess in, in the uh, documentary tony atlas says that you know he saw them go in the in the uh in the shower they closed the door and then he when he saw what was going on commotion in there he ran in there and held bruiser brody back and he was already stabbed and jose gonzalez went to stab him again and I guess it cut the the hair right off the ponytail off of Bruiser Brody and Atlas. Uh, you know, dragged him out of the shower and was calling for an ambulance. And I guess all the guys in the locker room thought it was, you know, uh, it was it was not it was not real. It was you know part of the show or part of us. You know, guys trying to rib each other. Jeez. And um, you know, the ambulance took forty five minutes. And I guess when they got to the, the hospital. Uh, you know, he wasn't, he was in the emergency room, but no doctor would see him. And I guess Tony Atlas went to a doctor and the doctor said, Hey, you know, what the common cold in America is, is what stabbings is down here in Puerto Rico. Wow. And, uh, I guess Atlas punched the wall and, you know, I mean, Tony Atlas is a big man. So when he, I guess he, he said in the show, this is according to him, he carried a doctor over his shoulder to, to Bruiser Brody and the doctor realized it's kind of serious, but it was too late. He. I guess he passed away that night. Mm-hmm. But, um, I mean, you wrestled, I mean, like I said, you wrestled him one-on-one in Memphis. There's some video, and I'm going to share some audio. You wrestled him in a tag team match, you and Bill Dundee um, uh, versus Bruiser Brody. And you have Ray Candy, who was uh, Kareem Muhammad in a tag yeah. team match. Uh, I mean, just, you know, watching some of the footage, you know, through this documentary, he looked stiff. He did look like he was one of those guys that was stiff. Well, you know what? Uh, like I said, that's what I'd always heard about him, and I'm sure it was true with certain guys. I can honestly say, with me, he was perfect. Yeah. I mean, not one, nothing out of line at all. I mean, and, you know, he was a lot bigger guy than me. Um, and he sold for me like a champ. He just, you know, he did, he did, he did everything. I mean, I think it's, he was, I think it just was the, I don't want to say the underneath guys, but the, yeah, the sort of the guys that when, when he was in the main event uh, with guys that, that he was, you know, accustomed to working with, I, th- I think that was, he was fine. But uh, uh, I, I never had one problem with him. All those, all those matches that I had, he was, he, you know, we, we worked a deal where he had my crown and, and uh, all, all, we did a, we did quite a bit with Bruiser Brody. This week, as Brody said, we don't have to worry about a referee. We don't have a referee in the ring. There's not going to be anybody to disqualify anybody. There's not going to be anybody to warn anybody or to try to uphold the rules. It's going to be anything goes. And that's just the way I like it, Brody. Because there'll be nobody in there to pull me off of you. And you're right. You've been knocked down before. And you're going to be knocked down Monday night so many times you need a calculator to count them. Now, I'm sick, and I've had it up to here, Lance, with people like Brody and with people like Tux Newman who think they're going to come in here and put me down. It hadn't been done yet, and it's not going to be done by you, Brody, and I'm going to prove it to you Monday night. Okay, Jerry, good luck to you, boy, and I'll tell you what, you got a mean one ahead of you because this is out here right now, but uh, evidently he's not too stationary on his feet. We're going to take a listen right now for it from his partner, who will be for that match coming up Monday night and the big Memorial Day special with 10 bouts, Kareem Muhammad and Bruiser Brody. Let's take a listen to Brody right now. Guess who? Guess who? It's the king of professional wrestling, Bruiser Brody. That's who. You know, I know a lot of good wrestlers came through here. Over the last 10 years, I'll bet you every good wrestler, every main event wrestler in professional wrestling came through this South area. I'll bet on it. But how many have you seen wearing the King's crown? Tell me. Now you tell me. How many have you seen wearing 
Jerry Lawler's crowd. One. And that's me, Bruiser Brody. You know, a lot of wrestlers, I know they come out here and they got that gift of talk. And they come out here and every week, some of you people who've been watching wrestling maybe 10, 15 years, and you hear all the same stories, all the same talk. How they're going to carry Jerry Lawler from limb to limb. How he ain't the king of wrestling. How they're better than he is. How they're tougher. How they're richer. How they're meaner. How about one that backs up what he says? How about one that can back up his own big mouth? Well, you're looking at a Bruiser Brody. In case you missed it, Lawler's in there with a great big pile of ice on his neck because he couldn't walk out of the ring. I didn't run out there and take this crown in the middle of one of his matches and run up the aisle like some scared yellow dog. I beat him up, walked over to the scoring table, picked it up, and did exactly what I've been telling you I was going to do for the last three weeks. Telling you exactly who was the king of professional wrestling. And so now you're looking at him. You're looking at the real king. I'd say the man who has the crown, he's the one. He's the big man. So take a close look. Because Jerry Lawler, he don't got the crown no more. It's sitting right here on the king's head. Right here. Well, you went down to Puerto Rico. I mean, you wrestled all over the world, and I'm sure, you know, obviously, you know, there's different fan bases. America is different than, you know, Japan. And I'm sure America is different than Puerto Rico. What do you remember about going down to Puerto Rico and wrestling in front of that kind of crowd? Well, it was crazy. The, the fans down there were just, like, um, so passionate and so into it. Uh, I do remember, like, somewhere, I can't remember what city, we wrestled outdoors, and it was it was crazy they somebody said hey do you see the concession stand out there they're selling rocks that fans can throw into the ring while we're in there wrestling wow. and sure enough they would i mean that was that was a big thing they would it would get so mad and so intense they would they would have rocks big rocks that they would throw in the ring at the at the heels you know um but no i i i wrestled uh with carlos cologne down there a lot and um he always man he always treated me great I'd send him some some good interviews down there, and uh, I'd go down there for a week at a time or four or five days at a time, and I always had a, I always had a great time. It's some you know great hotels. The beaches were awesome there. Uh, uh, it was so funny. Like uh, I just remember going. Like especially we went over to the mall when they had some time off, and went over to this mall, and it was you know it was just like it was like being in Miami, uh, actually except a few more people spoke Spanish, but, uh, it was, it was, it was really, uh, really nice. I just remember being impressed with, uh, the girls at the mall. It <laughs> seemed like every girl there was like beautiful. I was just like walking around going, Holy mackerel. Look at this. It's unbelievable. Every one of these, every girl you see is like, looked like a movie star. It was, it was crazy. Jeez. So I enjoyed going to Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> For more reasons than run. Yeah, yes, sir. Jeez. Well, yeah, that, that documentary for the all wrestling fans, I, it's on YouTube. You guys can watch it, but it's uh, they have a bunch of other documentaries coming out. Um, they did one on Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth, uh, Montreal Screwjob, the Von Erich family, and then they're going to have one about gorgeous Gino, and then the fabulous Mula is the last one. Oh, yeah. so. Basically, they have, you know, they kind of like do that. There's actual wrestlers like today wrestlers who are dressed up by like as like a Randy Savage or Miss Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like faded out. So like you kind of get the scope that they are that person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, like they had for the Bruiser Brody, you know, Dutch. They do a show, there's, a, there's a channel called Reels and they do a lot of shows like that where they get find somebody that looks pretty much like the star and you really, they will either get their back to them or like you said, a little bit faded out. And you, and you actually get the feeling that you're seeing, you're seeing, you know, real footage. And then they did, I don't know, did they throw in some real footage as well in these things? Yeah, I mean the, the yeah you know, the highlights of you know Bruiser Brody's career. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And whatnot. Yeah. But when they're, they're talking about the event that took place, uh, Dutch Mantel was was down there, and uh, mm -hmm. you know there was a guy. Well, Dutch, you know, Dutch went down there, and Dutch stayed. 
down there a long time. Dutch was the booker yeah. for Carlos for a long time in Puerto Rico. But there's a guy that had a cowboy hat and the beard and the mustache like Dutch. So, you know, he was like a dark oh. shadow, but you knew when they were talking about what was happening, that was Dutch in the camera shot. Well, uh, the the show, I, I don't remember. Was Dutch the booker at the time when this happened? No, I don't think so. He was there just to wrestle, I believe. He wrestle. said that he was in the locker room in the air. You know, he was in the arena when it took place. Um, but Tony Atlas was, I guess, the guy that, um, you know, saw, I guess, saw everything. But Dutch was there. Yeah. So, you know, Dutch, you know, was, was part of the whole um, commotion and what was going on the following the days, a couple of days after. But um, And Dutch, actually, he, um, for the other, the other uh, documentaries for this series, he's the narrator. And yeah, and uh, does does Jim Cornette have something to do with it too? Yeah, Jim Cornette helped out with the Von Eric family um, episode, and then uh, Mick Foley he narrated the Bruiser Brody uh, oh, episode. Wow. So, um, but yeah, so it's good. If you you know backstory, you know especially Macho Man and Randy Savage talking about their relationship, you know, on, in front of the camera and behind the camera. Um, but the dark side of the ring, the dark stories of professional wrestling. Mm. So. Guys, I wish you'd check it out. What about the light stories? The fun story? The light the good story. story. That's, you find all those right here on the <laughs> Dinner with the King. No one likes a, lot, a funny story. They like dark stories. They like to hear like, they're the stuff that they don't hear about on a regular basis. Oh, bad news. Dead. It travels fast. <laughs> bad news travels like wildfire. <laughs> good news travels slow. Hey, that could be a song. That could be a song. Who's gonna... You may have a future there. <laughs> all right, King. So, uh, what are you doing this week and this weekend? What you got coming up? Obviously, we got Starcast Memorial Day weekend. You can Actually, meet- I'm heading. I'm heading. Laura and I are heading to Florida tomorrow. Hadn't been. We haven't been down to our condo in Fort Myers in quite a while. We're heading down to Florida for a few days. Then this weekend, I'll be back. And uh, poor Lauren, <laughs> guess what she does Saturday mornings? Guess what she starts on? Uh, a week long trek to. Well, you, 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 you probably won't think this is too bad. She's on a week long school trip with oh, Peyton, to, to DC? some other moms to DC, yeah. then to New York City, and then back through Dollywood and back to Memphis on a bus. Oh, that's exciting. on a bus. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. So is this like yeah. a bunch? Is it I that... don't know if you know this is going to be quite the culture shock for Lauren. <laughs> it's I don't know if she's ever ridden on a bus. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, this is going to be. Hey. And it's her and a few moms are we there and yet? kids. Are we there yet? Yes. Are you kidding me? From Memphis to Washington D.C. Oh my God, Peyton! There's no Xbox, no PlayStation. Oh on man, on the bus you got to wait hours to get where you want to go. Yeah. Woo. Anyway, I've I, I've skipped out on that. I'm going to be <laughs> Doug Gilbert. I got to be wrestling a couple of guys up in uh, right on the other side, up near Louisville, Kentucky. It's actually over in Indiana, um, and the name escapes me right now. Even though Doug came down, we did an interview for it the other day. These these the nouns, the names of these towns, I can never remember. Evansville. What? No, it's not Evansville. No, I'm going to be in Evansville the following week. Okay. Jeff Osmond and his comic book store up there. I'll be talking more about that, but I can't think of this. Somewhere in Indiana, Saturday, next Saturday. Well, I'm sure you tweet yeah. it out. We'll tweet it out. You'll tweet Definitely it. tweet it out. You'll tweet it out. There was a photo. You were supposed to tweet out something the other day, a picture you said you're going to do on the show. Oh, you're um, the gift that someone gave you from Japan. Did I? I didn't send that out? No, you didn't send the photo out. Someone, I, someone kept tweeting at us about the photo saying where's that photo at they want to see was it. it it's not panini is it not panini it was definitely not panini <laughs> not pj but uh not pj let me see here but tweet that out when you when you get a chance so everybody check king's twitter to see the the gift that was sent over yeah i want to tweet out uh, i took some pictures last night uh, jerry calhoun was there at our match last night in tupelo me and calhoun and uh, bill dundee posed together did I take a picture of that little thing? I guess I never even took the picture of it. Ah, well, you should do that. People are asking. All right, so uh, second so like Starcast. Uh, like I said, uh, Jerry will be there all all the for a, few, a couple of days, Friday and Saturday. Meet and greets are available on Starcast.com. 
King will have a table, some 8x10s. You can get a photo with the King. And you're doing a show with JR. And I'm sure you'll be out and about. Uh, people can probably you know, see you while you're walking around. So StarCast.com for, for all the information about that and tickets to see the King back in Las Vegas. With Holy yellow, mackerel. Yellow this guy breezy. came up last time. It's got yellow beezy, not breezy. Breezy. Beezy. <laughs> beezy. Yeah, and uh, the words to his song as he was singing over and over, lip syncing as he got out of the car was... Oh, God, could, let's keep it PG. There's people, there's kids listening. Yeah, so I can't even say it. It was, <laughs> it was about, obviously about girls, right? No, it was just... Uh, uh, I'll give you the first the first two letters of the first word and the first letter of the second word and it was just those two words over and over over and over and over and over and it was M F N. <laughs> yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sweet. Over and over. <laughs> right. Listen, this guy brought this picture up to me. Two pictures up to me last night. We re- I've got to I got to tweet these out. It's kind of funny. This guy brought a picture of me sitting, him sitting on my lap. He's got the crown on his head, and it was from 30 years ago. And so we recreated the picture last night, me and the same guy, 30 years later. Here are some lyrics from the song Hate the Way. No, I know you can't say that. Hate the Way I Love You by Yella Beezy. Say I hate the way I love you, girl. Hate the way I love you. Yeah, I hate the way I love you, girl. Hate the way I love you. <laughs> That's some poetry right there. <laughs> Never you heard think, of him. Do you think he writes all these lyrics himself? <laughs> I, would, I would probably think so, yeah, maybe. I don't know. But the song is <laughs> hating on hating that he loves a girl, I guess. There's some bad words in here. Oops, I can't. I'm not going to say Oh, yeah, a lot of bad words in there. A lot of bad words. All right, King. Well, we talked about Bruiser Brody. Uh, we talked about Cauliflower Alley Club. David Arquette turned a heel. Yeah. Kings 171 on the title win list. Talked about Tupelo. Talked about a lot of things in this podcast. So, All right. Then I got to ask you one question. Uh, what's my final word? Yeah, final word. Final word is, can the Indians not be injured all the time? Oh my gosh! What about today? What was the final score? I think it was ten nothing. Ten to nothing, and the catcher was pitching again for the second time this oh year. Oh my god! Well, you know, they haven't been perfect, but for you know Mar- April and May teams, I mean, usually the Indians, you know, cold weather April they don't do too yeah. well. And yeah. they're eighteen and eighteen and fourteen. I mean, that's not bad. I know. We just gotta. There's no hitting the outfield. We have not one outfielder that can hit it home run thank god for carlos santana no kidding but then they have kluber's going to be out for a couple months who knows yeah. how he's going to be yeah clevenger you got guys injured Not i know good. Not and good. that pitcher today he gave up five runs and didn't even get an out well i guess he got one out Not good. gave up a grand slam and another run not good not good, not good, but we'll keep the chin up. Yes, sir. All right, King. Well, uh, anything you want to say before we wrap it up? No, not a thing. Not a thing. All right, we'll talk to you next week here on Dinner with the King. Dinner with King on Twitter, Instagram. We're on dinnerwiththeking.com, potavenue.com slash dinnerwiththeking or potavenue.com slash king. Follow Jerry at Jerry Lawler. Follow me at Glenmore CLE, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Yeah. The preceding show is a Pod Avenue production. Greetings, wrestling fans. This is Dave Dynasty, host of the Dave Dynasty Show, the podcast that every week brings you nearly two hours of pro wrestling goodness from the Midwest. We feature interviews with the legends of the past, stars of today, and the prospects of tomorrow. We have segments that feature classic wrestling audio, whole episodes devoted to the history of Midwest pro wrestling, and much, much more. Do not miss an episode of the Dave Dynasty Show. We are available on all podcast platforms. Platforms, or you can access past episodes and all of our social media links by visiting DaveDynasty.com. Be good, be safe, and keep on growing.